Glad that uh, that you are with us. We're able to have the band and uh, through all the technology that uh, that we're able to do and still still gather together at this time. Well, we are in this series taking a look at, uh, at the letters that Paul wrote to the Corinthians, to the church in Corinth. And he wrote um, several, we think, uh, may, maybe as many as four. We know that we have 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. We, we've been working our way slowly through them over the last several weeks. And, uh, and we're coming, we're getting to the end of 2 Corinthians. So we're sort of coming to the end of this. And we're taking a look at, uh, at 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to go find your Bible and pull that out, open it up to 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9. Or if you're with us online, online environment, there's actually a Bible tab there. And you can pull that up or pull out your phone and go to 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. Either way, we're going to walk through it today. We're just going to learn from the this letter. Paul wrote this letter to this church a couple thousand years ago, and yet it's amazingly practical. And as we've been, uh, as we've been walking through, Paul's talked to them about all kinds of different things. Paul has not been really easy on this church at Corinth. He, he knew them. He was, uh, he was an apostle for them, right? He was one of the leaders kind of oversaw the church. And yet they had a, a tension in their relationship. Paul spoke to them as a pastor and as an apostle, even as a father. Paul talked to them about some kind of tough things. So he talked them about some of the immorality that was going on. He said the, the, the choices that you make, they, they have to be better. Paul, Paul talked to them uh, about uh, their, their sense that they were already in heaven. They were kind of already living a, a heaven-like life. And so because of that, they, they had too much, uh, they, they were looking too much for the, the right miracles to have happened all the time. And, and they, were, they were living as if heaven had already come and, and they were ignoring the things of the world. Paul said, you can't do that. You can't just ignore where you are. And, and, and they lean too much on miracles and, and, and on the, um, the sort of special, out of the norm things of this world. They were looking for too much of that. And Paul said, listen, God's at work and God does show up sometimes in the supernatural, but you don't base your whole faith on that. Paul talked to them uh, about some uh, tricky stuff. He, he actually talked to them about how they treat their bodies. And he talked to them about sex and marriage and how you uh, do that well. And what does that mean to do that and honor God? And he said, as you do that, it, it impacts the whole church, right? It, the, the way we live and the way we live towards each other and the relationships, the way we care towards each other. Paul said, that impacts the whole church. So he talked to them about all kinds of sticky issues. But, but here in 2 Corinthians, Paul's finally, it seems like he's trying to kind of repair the relationship that he's had with them where, where there have been some rifts and some brokenness. In fact, we think at one point uh, they seem to have accused Paul of being outside of himself, of being crazy, right? Uh, that's, that's kind of the language they were using. And Paul's sort of defending that and he's trying to repair that relationship. And in the middle of that time of repair and Paul saying, Let, let's, let's uh, be one, let's be together, Paul stops and he goes into now, we're going to do two chapters, two whole chapters, and there's really more than that. He's going to do two whole chapters just to talk to them about money. That's right. Uh, Paul's talking to them about all kinds of tricky things. Then he's repairing the relationship, and now he decides, what should we talk about? How about how you're doing with your money? In fact, Paul's going to spend two chapters on fundraising. And I'm like, oh man, really, Paul? In fact, I don't know why I chose for us to walk through First and Second Corinthians because, I mean, it's been one tricky thing after another. And then we get to the point where I think resolution is coming and Paul says, we should talk to each other about money because that's easy, right? Well, that's what we're going to do today. We're going to take a look at it. We're just going to, we're going to walk through this passage and, and we're going to hear what Paul has to say. And I think, well, Paul, why are you going there? Why money? Why, why talk about fundraising? But you know, um, money is actually a pretty big, I don't know, it's, it's a worry for me. It's a thing I, I actually think about a lot. 
In fact, a lot of the decisions that Cammie and I make, they're, they're, they're based around money. It's, it's something I have to deal with every day. It, it sets a lot of the priorities for uh, what we do as a family. And it, it's always been, I mean, I've always been worried about money. I know where our money goes. I, like, I worry about every little cent of money. I've always kind of been, well, I've been pretty cheap, uh, to be honest with you. I mean, it's just, I've always been worried about that. I remember when Cammie and I first started dating, and uh, man, I'm romantic, you know. I asked her out on a date, and I couldn't wait to go with her on a date, and I invite her out, and I showed up to pick her up, and I said, Cam, uh, I am so excited to take you out on a date. Now, here's the thing. Um, we can go to this, you know, nice restaurant that you, you, uh, you really want. It's, it's, uh, man, it's a cool restaurant. I can't wait. I, I think this will be great to go, uh, but here's the catch. Uh, you have to get what's on this coupon because otherwise we got to go to the, you know, we got to go to this cheaper. Uh, we're going to McDonald's, you know, we, get, we can go to McDonald's and I'll get you anything you want, or we'll go to this uh, nice restaurant as long as you get what's on this coupon. And she thought, man, this is a romantic guy, right? I mean, she, she, uh, she was not sure. She had, she had not, I don't think she had ever had anyone ask her on a date and bring a coupon before. And uh, that, that is probably not the most endearing quality of me, but I was worried about every little, uh, every little bit of money, every little cent. In fact, uh, one of the things I often kind of joke about, but there's some truth to it. The reason I was called to the seminary I was called to you know, when pastors talk about what seminary they went to, they say, well, you know, just God called me here. You know how God spoke to me about going to the seminary I went to? Through a financial aid package, right? They said, hey, we've got great financial aid. And I said, I hear the Holy Spirit speaking to me. That, uh, because, you know, money's a driver, right? Uh, even when we go on vacations, even little road trips, I actually make a spreadsheet with a budget. Uh, maybe I've done too many youth ministry retreats in my years of planning and whatever. I, I don't know. But I actually make a spreadsheet with a, with a budget. And we sit down and look at, at all the numbers. Because, um, because I'm, 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 I, you know, I'm not trying to get wealthy. Uh, especially not as a pastor. That's not, the, that's not how it works. But I, I do worry about him. And I'm always worried, you know, will we have enough? And you know, will we have enough for our kids? And will we have enough to set them up on their future? You know, money has a lot of my attention. And, and if something has that much of my attention and that, that much of my priorities, it matters that much to me, then it, then it also matters to God. You know, and, and as a pastor, I, I, I sit with a lot of families, a lot of couples. And you know what I find? Money is, is uh, one of the core tensions in a lot of marriages. And it comes down to some of the things like values and how, what you value and how you handle, but how you handle money. Well, that, that actually, man, that's, one of, that's some of the big pressures in a family. And some of the big decision points. The way you get from one place to the next as a family and the trajectory you go on and how you set your kids up. Well, well how you handle money, that, that's really key to that. It really matters. So Paul writes this letter to this church in Corinth, 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9. Now I want to set the stage for you a little bit. You, you got to kind of remember some things. We haven't talked about these much since back in, um, in, in 1 Corinthians, but you got to remember what this town of Corinth is like. Remember, uh, this town of Corinth is a place that, that uh, it, there's not really old uh, established families there. There's not the old established aristocracy in Corinth. Corinth had been wiped out by Rome and, and basically restarted and rebuilt. And for that reason, it was uh, a relatively young city, and it was on this this little, uh, uh, just this little bit of isthmus, this this little place where uh, seafarers wanted to bring their uh, ships up to one port, drop off their goods, and then uh, they would carry things across the land and put a, put them onto the other port to go on over to Rome. Or sometimes they would even drag whole ships across that, that, little, uh, that little bit of land. It's just this little neck of land there. And, uh, and the, the people of Corinth figured out, hey, we could make some good money uh, doing trade. 
and we can make some good money uh, in, in the, in the uh, trade and logistics business here as we help these ships get their goods across. And so Corinth was a place where people came to make it. People that didn't have families, that, that had great wealth on generation on generation, they could show up in Corinth, and if you worked hard enough, you could actually become rich there. It was unlike a lot of the rest of the Roman world. And, and not, not only that, but you could make it big time. You could become fabulously rich. And, and, and Corinth was one of the few places where it was really wealth and not your family and not your family's status. That, that actually meant what kind of power and what kind of place you would have in that society. You could work your way up if you, if you had enough money. And so this is the city of Corinth. And in that city of Corinth, how, the money that you made, that, that's what mattered. If you made enough money, you could be somebody there. If you made enough money, you could have the Corinthian dream. And, uh, and so this is the people to whom Paul writes this letter. And he writes a letter as a father, and he's given them instruction. But he, it's important to Paul to talk to them, actually, about money. Now, Paul's in the middle of a fundraising campaign. He's raising money for the church in Jerusalem. Now, there had been a, a bit of a rift. There, there had been some difficulties that had gone on between those who had been Jewish and converted to Christianity and those who were from the, the Roman world, the Greek-speaking Roman world, we call them the, the Greco-Roman world or the Hellenized world, the, the, those who were the Gentiles that had come to Christ and, and had more of the Roman and Greek values and those that had grown up as Jews. And there, there'd been a rift in that. And those that, that came from the Jewish church had been impoverished in a lot of different ways. They, they'd been kicked out of Rome. And uh, that had been a problem there in Rome. And then in Jerusalem, they had been under great persecution. And so the church in Jerusalem, which was primarily uh, still those followers of Christ who had uh, been Jewish, they, they were in, totally impoverished. A bit of famine there, and, and, uh, and they did not have enough money. They did not have, uh, they did not have what they need to get by. And, and Paul saw sort of two opportunities here. One opportunity was for him to take care of the needs of the people of the church. These were, these were the followers of Christ. They were the people of the church, and as, uh, we're going to take care of them. We're going to care for those who are in need. That's what the church does. And so Paul saw this opportunity to go around to the other churches, and he had sort of a big circuit of churches that he was connected with and what had been Turkey and, and uh, on around that, that kind of part of Europe there. And Paul was, uh, was speaking to these churches in Greece, different places like that. And Paul uh, is saying, hey, look, here's an opportunity to care for those outside of yourself, to care for those in need. And so Paul wants to give him that opportunity. Paul also saw an opportunity to kind of bridge some of the, the bad feelings, some of the things that had not been handled well between the, the Jewish church and the, and the Greek-speaking church. And as things had not been handled quite as well as, it, as they should have been, and there had been a bit of a rift, Paul thought, hey, this can bring the church back together. And so Paul's on this mission and it's in this, in this setting that he writes this letter to the church in Corinth. And he's going to be sending a couple guys to come and, and help collect this because, you know, somebody would have to come and collect an offering and bring it all the way to the church in Jerusalem. And so they're kind of going around, they're collecting it. But Paul writes this for Macedonia. Now, Macedonia is another area where there were a group of churches there. And Paul is, uh, at this time, he's with those churches. And those churches have given a great gift They've come up with, uh, with a great amount to go to the church in Jerusalem. But here's the thing. The church in Macedonia, very poor. Corinth, the Corinthian church, they had wealth. They were doing fine. They, they, they were fine financially, but the Macedonian church, they were poor. And Paul saw this opportunity. He said, look, this church gave even though they didn't have much. They gave, uh, they gave above and beyond what would be expected. And so Paul's going to bring all that together in this letter. He's, he's sitting with this group of, of, of Christians that really didn't have a lot, but were willing to give. They had these open hearts and open hands about it. And he's writing to this church in Corinth, the church that, that had a great deal. And he wants to talk to them about how, how do you handle money. Now, uh, that's the context. About a year earlier than this, Paul, uh, they, they had said that they were willing the church in Corinth was willing to be a part of this offering, and they had started to take a collection for the offering, but, but they hadn't finished. And uh, they, they had said they were going to give more, and they haven't done it yet. 
And so this is sort of part two. This is phase two of the, of the fundraising campaign where Paul says, look, hey, uh, let's finish what we started. Now, I want you to take your scripture and go with me. And today, um, we're just going to walk through it. Now, there's one passage in here that there are a couple that are some of Paul's uh, maybe more famous words that you would know of Paul that, that you would uh, you'd say, ah, you know, I've heard that somewhere. And uh, there, there are a couple of those from Paul, but there's one that's probably the most well-known. And it says this, um, this is uh, chapter 9, verse 7, right? Chapter 9, verse 7, Paul says this, Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give. Not, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And, uh, and that's one of the lines that Paul gives them. God, he says, look, you should give what's, what's, uh, you know, what's kind of on your heart, what you've decided to give, and not do it reluctantly. Why? Because God loves a cheerful giver. And I think, uh, Paul, like, why does God care? Right? I mean, if they're getting the money, you're giving the money to God, you're kind of doing your duty. It's, you know, look, uh, you know, I did what God called me to do. I, you know, I, I cared for somebody that is in need uh, or wrote the check. Why does God care if I'm cheerful about it? I don't have to be happy about giving money away. But there's a secret here. And that's what I want us to be looking for as we read through this passage. You see, Paul knows that money Money is a gateway to the heart. Like, I, and I don't want you to hear that in the wrong way. It's not that, not that money is how God captures your heart. It's not, not, that's not the case. But money kind of reveals where our priorities are. And, 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 and uh, money is held so closely that it actually becomes a, a heart issue. In other words, if I begin to handle my money in different ways and I begin to see it in a different way, it doesn't just change my pocketbook. It doesn't just change money. But how I see money and how I handle money, that actually impacts my heart. And so Paul wants to talk to them about being cheerful givers because Paul really wants to talk to them about their hearts. And this is one of the ways that you can work on your heart. It's by working on how you handle money. So let's look back at it. Uh, we'll start in chapter 8. So if you have a Bible, you turn there with me. I've uh, printed mine off today. And Paul starts, and, uh, and he tells them a little bit about the Macedonian church and, and, uh, and, and the, the great gift that the church in Macedonia gave. And then he is telling them he's going to send Titus. And uh, Titus is going to come. Titus is, uh, you know, working with Paul, and, and he's going to send Titus to, for this collection. And in verse 6, we want to pick up. So we urge Titus, just as he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. In other words, he's asking Titus to go uh, and help finish this off, finish the, the fundraising project off. So Titus would show up with them. And then in verse 7 says this, But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love that we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. I love that. I love that line, right? Paul says to the church in Corinth, you guys excel in everything. You excel in love and grace. You excel in all the most important things. So I want you also to excel in giving, right? Be good at giving too. Now, that's a classic dad line. You know, I'll, I'll say to one of my kids, look, oh, man, you're such a great kid. You're, you're an incredible kid. You're, I see this in you. I, I, I see greatness in you. I, I see how wonderful you, God created you, how smart, how sharp. You, you've got a good heart. And then I'll say, now, live up to that, right? Live up to the heart that you have. Be who you really are. Yes, I, I, I love the way that Paul kind of throws that in there. You excel in everything. You're the best. So also be the best in giving. That's how he wants to start off with them. And then in, in verse 8, I am not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love. Uh, he, he's saying, look, this, this should play out in, in how you love people. And verse 9, he's going to allude to to, uh, 
to the great, what we call the great emptying, right? There's a, there's a different passage, Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 through 8, where, where Paul talks about this emptying of Christ. We think it was maybe an early hymn of the church where they talk about how, how Christ was uh, God, but he uh, poured himself out, he became human, right? And he took on even death, he emptied himself. And Paul's going to make an allusion to that, that same idea, that same concept here. This is chapter 8, verse, uh, verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet your, for your sake he became poor, so that through his poverty you might become rich. Now, Paul's mixing metaphors here. He's not talking about money, his richness and poverty here. He's talking about in life. That you might become rich in life. You might, your life might be full and fulfilled. That you, might, that you might have life with God. But the only way that you're able to do that is that Jesus became poor. You know, all the way through First and Second Corinthians, Paul views the whole thing through this lens of the gospel. Everything that Paul talks about, he wants to view through this lens of Christ who came and gave himself for us, who died for us, and was resurrected. And even money, Paul is going to look at through that lens. He's going to say, look, look, uh, Christ became poor. He emptied himself out so that you could be filled. And he wants to set that up as uh, the first step, the first kind of approach to money. He, he talks about emptying yourself for the sake of others. And, and um, uh, Paul wants you to get that. That's so that, that's where he's going to start. Now, um, uh, this is, uh, it, he's, he's going to kind of uh, tell him, don't worry too much, though. Okay, don't worry too much. So as we get a little bit further down there, um, in verses 11 and 12, right in there, he says, now listen, this is according to your means. We're not trying to make the church in Jerusalem rich. In fact, he's got this sort of principle he talks about of equality. We're, we're, we're trying to uh, help th those are in need. And later when you're in need, you're not right now, but later when you're in need, they'll help you. We want to care for each other. He, he's not saying you've got to give beyond your means. In fact, he, he makes that explicit. So even though uh, he's got this example of Christ being uh, emptying himself, he, he also kind of backs down and says, now don't worry this is according to your needs. The, the point is, we're going to do what we can to care for each other. We're going to love each other. We're going to love each other in each other's churches. We're going to take care. Okay, well, I want to keep us moving. This is, uh, we're going to go to chapter 9. And in chapter 9, uh, he's going to kind of keep along this same argument. And, uh, and he goes back to kind of the father thing, right? He goes back in this kind of father role. And, and he says, look, I've been bragging about you. This is chapter 9, verses 2. And I love it. This is a classic father line. He says, I've been bragging about you to everybody I talked about. How great you are. I bragged about you to the Macedonian church. In fact, I bragged about you and how great you are so much that it called the Macedonian church to action. It's one of the reasons that they jumped in and were active in their faith. And now he says, don't let my bragging be hollow. Right? He goes, it's kind of that same idea. Live up to this bragging. Because I know who you are and I, I know that you're great. But I want to focus in on just this little bit of a passage. So if you haven't pulled out your Bible yet, get it now, okay? Get it now, because we're going we're gonna to dig in a little bit. Here in verse 5, it says this, uh, So I thought it was necessary to urge the brothers to visit you in advance and finish the arrangements for the generous gift you had promised. He says, I'm sending Titus, right? And I'm sending some brothers to come along, and, and they're going to help collect this gift. And I, I want you to know ahead of time so that you're ready and then, uh, here comes this line, then it will be ready as a generous gift. This is the end of verse 5. Then it will be ready as a generous gift, not as one grudgingly given. So Paul says, it's about the attitude of your heart and this attitude of generosity and understanding what is God's and what is, what is not, what is what, you know, that, that God's, uh, that everything that you have has been given to you by God. Not grudgingly, because this, this is a heart issue. This is what's going on in your own heart. 
Now, he gives this principle. Uh, uh, those who uh, remember this, this is verse 6, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Uh, here's this passage, this uh, this. Uh, analogy, one from farming, from agriculture in their area, right? There, there have been some agriculture around them. They would have gotten the idea. If you sow sparingly, you'll reap sparingly. If you, if you sow generously, you'll reap generously. And Paul says, this is true here as well. Now, Paul, get this now, Paul isn't saying, uh, here's a quick way to get rich. If you give a lot to God, you're going to get a lot richer. It's going to be perfect. You know, uh, sometimes you'll see that. We have some televangelists that'll even say things uh, very similar to that on TV. And they'll say, look, if you want a great gift from God, if you want a great blessing from God, if you want to get rich, what you need to do is give a lot to the ministry and then, uh, and then God will make you rich. Remember, Paul's writing this from Macedonia. They weren't rich. He was writing with the Macedonians as an example. He's not saying God's gonna make you rich. What he is saying, though, is if you want your heart to be impacted, if you want your life to be impacted, then you've got to dive in. You want to know what it looks like to trust God, then lean into God. And that's true even with something so scary as your finances. That if you begin to give them to God, you will begin to understand the security that comes with living in God's will. That you will start to understand what it means to rest and rest easily in God. You know, for so many of us, we're so worried about money. We keep trying to make more, but even uh, though you make more, it still becomes an insecure place to live. You can find money being just this great treadmill. There's never quite enough. There have been all kinds of studies that looked at different people of uh, different amounts of money, and there, there's a certain base level that, that brings some comfort. But once you get beyond that, that base level of comfort, if you ask somebody, how much money do you need? It's always a little bit more. And Paul says, if you want to know what it's like to live in the security of a father who has enough and who's got you, then you got to lean in. And if you lean in, you'll sow generously. And as you sow generously, you'll reap generously. This will impact your heart. It'll impact your soul. It'll impact your, uh, your, uh, the way you look at the world around you. I, I have some friends that are uh, great givers. And they, they, uh, they spoke to me about this years ago and said, look, this is just our passion in life is, is uh, to be generous. And I, I'd never met anyone that said, this is my, my passion in life, my gift is just to be generous. So he said, this is my passion, my goal in life is to be generous. And, and uh, I had just some great conversations with that family about it. And, and, and they, they, they basically said, look, the, the more we do this, the more we see hope in the world. It wasn't that they were just generous to one church, although, although they were, but they, but they were generous to all kinds of different uh, people in need, all kinds of different important ministries going on around their city and around the world. And they said the more that they did it, the more they saw hope. The more that it lifted their hearts, and the more they were able to see God at work in the people around them. So Paul gives us this principle. He says, don't do this grudgingly. Don't do it reluctantly. He says, it's a heart matter. And if you want your heart to be impacted, then the more you do, the more you're invested, the more you'll actually reap. That's this principle. Um, that's this principle that God gives us. Now, now Paul, when he says uh, God loves a joyful giver, and he, and he says don't give reluctantly, don't give under compulsion. It's not about giving under compulsion. It's about changing the attitude of your heart. Paul's actually hearkening back to uh, something that the Jewish, uh, the Jewish readers of this would have known, would have, would have recognized. This comes from Deuteronomy. It's their Old Testament. And in uh, Deuteronomy 15, you get really similar language that, that God loves this uh, uh, giver that doesn't give out of compulsion compulsion, but it's out of response to God's grace and out of the ability to give. It's a sense of giving out of abundance because I've decided to, not because somebody's making me. It's not that, hey, uh, there's this, uh, you know, I have to check this box off. If the church requires me to give or, or, or I, I got to give because I'm required to by God in, in order to be in God's good graces. 
Paul takes that right off the table, and he does it by pointing all the way back to the Old Testament, saying, no, that's not the attitude uh, towards money. The attitude towards money that comes right out of the Old Testament is that everything really is God's. It's all owed to him. And what we do is we turn to God and we give him our first fruits. We, we give back the, the first, uh, that first 10% and we say, God, look, look, it's yours. It's not mine. And I just be reminded that everything that I have is from you and because of you. And so I, I give you that first 10%. And, uh, and, and, and that's just a marker. That, that, that's just uh, this, this old style, this first fruits marker. This is a good reminder. I give to God first. And as I, as I do that, I do that out of a choice. Now, here's the beauty. Here's the key of that choice. Because if I, I start to make, a, make it a choice and not a compulsion, it becomes something that actually frees me. So I, I'm not trapped in this need to give in order to get something. No, in, instead, it starts to make money uh, more loosely held in my hands. I start to be free when I go, look, I can give this to God because I, I choose to give it, not because it's easy, not because I have extra money laying around, because I know that's not true. But as I start to have a relationship with my money, I start to actually think about my money, I start to understand that really it's all God's and that really God has provision for me and that God uh, promises to take care of me. And so Paul goes right to that statement. He, he goes, uh, you know, this is all right in order there. It says, each of you, this is verse seven, each of you should give as you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion for God loves a cheerful giver. And then verse eight, and God is able to bless you abundantly. So that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, and you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. As I began to let it go, I began to see money as actually God's. And it starts to loosen its grip on me. Because the truth is, money actually drives me. It actually tells me where to go. It has a grip on me. But as I start to give it freely, I start to care about those in need. I start to understand that this is God's and God's in control and God has me. And Paul wants to take away the fear of this. And so Paul gives them this reminder. Look, God's got everything. He's got abundance. It's not scarcity. It's not just uh, only, uh, you know, uh, will there be just enough? God's got enough. He's got enough for you. He's got enough for your family. And God, uh, God knows you. God knows your family. Look, I, I, I see this often in families, how they view money actually impacts kind of how they parent their kids. It impacts really um, so much about their decision making. And, and the question becomes, will we see money as something that there is a, a plenty, right? That, that God's actually in control and God has plenty and God cares for us. Or will we see it as something that's always a scarcity? Never knowing if there's going to be enough around the next corner and this, this constant worry and sense of scared, uh, God, you know, will I have enough for tomorrow? And if we begin to live in this sense of scarcity, we're not able to trust Right? We're not able to uh, sense this, uh, look for these opportunities for blessings around us. We're, we're not able to see money as something that we can use to care for people around us because we, you know, we're so scared that there won't be enough there. I got to hold it for me for tomorrow, so I, I can't really care for those around me. Money doesn't become an opportunity to bless if it's, if it's the thing I'm focused on, if I just don't have enough. And what that creates is a great anxiety. And if you want to create great anxiety in your family, then, then uh, have a bad relationship with money. Now, I want you to get this. I, I understand, I know, there are families that really just don't have enough. 
And, and that's our, our job as a church to come around them. Uh, you want to get what Paul's really saying. He uh, invites them into this opportunity because he's talking about a church that the group in Jerusalem does not have enough. And what he really says to them, and this is kind of interesting, as we get on to the last part of that verse, this is verse 11, he goes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Now, that's really key. He doesn't say, you'll give and there'll be thanksgiving and it'll be thanksgiving to you. They'll be so thankful for you. Paul doesn't say that. He says, look, when you give, they'll be thankful to God. Why? Because giving is actually an opportunity to be involved in God's work. Do you know how God is going to care for his people? You know how God, it says, if you give, it gives God an opportunity to bless people. How does God get to bless people? Through you, through me. If I'm willing to be generous and give, then that, then that, that opens up this door for God to be able to bless the people around me. We get to be a part of God caring for those people who don't have enough. And yet what's so amazing, I often find families that you, you would say, I don't know how they have enough. You know, they, they seem to barely get by. And yet they have this attitude of generosity even about that family. This real sense that God is in control, God is in charge, and God will guide them and direct them. It doesn't make it, uh, you know, okay to just say, hey, look, we don't have to worry about money at all. No, we have to plan well. We have to work hard. We try to save. We're to be real responsible with our money. Man, even, you know, at this church, I mean, we're tight. We make spreadsheets for everything, right? We know where every dime, that, that stuff matters. Okay, we want to be careful with it. But there's a difference in that and saying we're anxious with it. We can't give anything away. Paul's inviting the people in Corinth to a different place with money because money actually drives them there. I, I know it's different for us, right? But Corinth, wealth builds everything. And Paul says to this church, you want to change your heart? Start with money. That's a really practical way. If I want to know what your priorities really are, right, I'll look at your, I'll look at your balance sheet. Paul invites them into something new. And he goes, hey, look, here's, a, here's a way to just start. You, you want to start leaning on God and faith? I want you to start giving it away and give it away freely. Uh, take it away from something that, that, uh, that is driving you and instead make it something that you can offer up. Start to change how you view money instead of something that, that, that there's just not enough of to, hey, it's all God's and God has all the money and God's given you the money he's given you as an opportunity to be a part of his blessing, to be a part of his blessing of the community around. Now, um, I, I, what's great about this passage is that we're just walking through Corinthians, right? This is not, uh, we're not doing a fundraiser today. This is not fundraising time. I mean, that's an important part of what it means to be a follower of Christ, but I get to talk to you not about, you know, how we're raising money here at the church. That's not what we're doing today. I wanted to talk to you just from the scripture about money because um, Paul knew it was important. Because Paul knew it was close to your heart. Because Paul knew that for many of you, money is a tension uh, in your family. Money is part of the anxiety that you feel every day. And he wants you to begin to reorient your view of it. It's all God's. And so I want to leave you with this passage today. This is uh, Paul. I want to read it all together because we can walk through this really close, slowly. But this is uh, 2 Corinthians, right? 9, starting in 6. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided to give in your heart. Not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. God's invited you into this relationship with him, one that's fulfilling one that has to change the patterns of your life. 
And one great practical way to step forward in that is to begin to change how you handle money, to start to give some away. And as you do it, you begin to realize this is an opportunity to bless, that this money doesn't have to control you, that it's actually God's. Not only does God have people kind of that out there that, that need your money and you're going to give to them, but God also has you. He's caring for you. This is really a great passage, even if money is a tricky thing to talk about. 